Let's go over the details of the machine we've built so far. In the first video, I built Benita's 6502 project on breadboard, then transferred it to a perf board. The main difference was I put in a big 4 to 1 address multiplexer between the CPU and the memory. In the second video, I wired up a Rasen generator using an EEPROM and produced an H-Sync, V-Sync and active signal that the monitor could lock onto. In this video, I'm going to combine these, add in a few more registers and a shift register, and generate monochrome video out. The NTSC version of the VIC-20 has a dot clock of 4.09 MHz, and the CPU clocks exactly one quarter of this at 1.02 MHz. So for every 8 pixels on the display, we have two CPU cycles, and therefore two windows of access for the VIC chip into the memory system. Remember, from the 6502 timing diagram, the CPU only really needs to have access to the memory when clock's high. OK, so what information from the memory system does the VIC chip need on a pixel-by-pixel -pixel basis to generate video? In the first step, we need to look up the character that we're about to scan out. This is based on the screen location of the character in the 22x23 grid, as well as the contents of some of the programmable registers in the VIC chip, and we'll go over this in more detail later. The location in memory is actually variable, but because of the way the VIC chip's wired, this can only come from the internal 5K of SRAM. This bank of 74LS245s actually prevents the VIC chip accessing cartridge memory. Step 2, we need to perform a colour RAM lookup. Again, this is mostly based on the screen location of the character. The colour RAM resides from 9400 hex to 97FF, and it's 1K by 4 bits of memory. The third step in the process is the bitmask lookup. The VIC chip has two modes for displaying pixels. There's a character mode, where there's a one-to-one -one mapping of bits in the bitmask and pixels on the display, and multicolor mode, where two bits represent one double-wide pixel. In this video, we're only going to be looking at character mode, but we'll go into multicolor mode in the next video. This presents us with a bit of a problem. We need three memory reads, but we only have two memory access slots available. One solution is to slow the 6502 down to half a megahertz and give the CPU a limited number of accesses during the active window. If you've watched my series on the ZX Spectrum, you'll see that that's exactly what the ULA in that machine does during active video. But for the VIC chip, they had another trick up their sleeve. Because the color memory is stored in a different physical device compared to main memory, and because the lower nine bits of the lookup address are the same, we can access these two memories in parallel. But that means the VIC chip needs an extra path to take data from both chips at once. It actually does this by having a 12-bit data bus instead of an 8-bit data bus. This lets the VIC chip read the character value and the color value in the one memory access window. The second memory access window is for bitmask lookup, and this can occur from either the character ROM or from main memory. This is how the VIC chip gets the information it needs for video out. Just as an aside, I'm not completely sure how the VIC chip aligns CPU access with video. There are two possible combinations, 1 and 2. I'd personally use this one because it saves a register, but if you know which one the actual VIC chip uses, let me know in the comments below. What does all this mean for our VGA VIC-20 build? In the prototype so far, the CPU address bus is permanently selected to go through to the memory, and the memory data bus feeds directly back to the 6502. We can do this because we aren't using the data from the memory for video, but now we want to get a video output, so we need a way of isolating the memory's data bus from the CPU data bus. Like the VIC-20, I'm going to use a 748C245 to do this, although technically the VIC-20 uses a 74LS245, but I tend to use them interchangeably when describing the circuits. Let me wire this chip in here. I've removed the wires which directly connect the CPU with the memory, and now I'm wiring one side of the 74HC245 to the CPU itself. The other side of this chip connects to the memory, and I'll wire this up a bit later in the video. 
I've timed it, and it actually takes longer to make these videos than it takes to wire these boards together. So don't forget to subscribe if you haven't done so already. This bidirectional octal buffer uses the clock bar signal to enable the device, and it uses the CPU read write bar line to select the direction of the data flow. When clock bar is high, meaning that the CPU clock's low, the CPU data bus and the memory data bus are effectively disconnected. Next, we'll look at the memory accesses in a bit more detail. First of all, VGA has double the H sync rate of NTSC, which means for the same number of pixels in a scan line, we have to double the dot clock. If I keep the CPU clock at 1 MHz, this means I only have one memory access window per 8 screen pixels. In this build, I'm using a single static RAM chip to store the character matrix in the color map, so we can't use the same trick to V20 used by having a 12-bit wide data bus. Fortunately, the static RAM I'm using, the 628128-70, is about 4 to 5 times faster than the 2114s used in the original design. What I'm planning to do is give the CPU access for the first four pixels, the fifth pixel slot's unused, the sixth slot is for the character matrix lookup, the seventh slot is for color, and the eighth slot is used to read the bitmap mask. This means I have four different address lookups in one CPU cycle, and this is the reason that I use the 74HC153s in the address multiplexer. The first input is for the CPU, the second is for the character address, the third is for the color address, and the fourth is a bitmap address. We have two multiplexer inputs which select the appropriate input, so we're going to have to generate these signals too. Both of these are low for the first five clock signals, then multiplexer zero is high for the sixth and eighth slot, while multiplexer one is high for the seventh and eighth slot. I need to be a bit more careful with the clock design now. I can generate these multiplexer signals off the 74HC161 in the clock circuit by ending together the Q3 output with Q1 and Q2. Q0 and Q3 are effectively the inverse of what I need for pixel clock and CPU clock, but remember, I also want CPU clock bar for the 74HC245, which isolates the CPU bus and the memory data bus. Generally, in the prototypes I build, I like the clock signals to be in phase with each other, and I don't like these gate delays. They can cause bugs that are really hard to find. The way I solve this is to have another octal D-type flip-flop, which is clocked directly from the 16 MHz oscillator. That way, all of the signals coming out of this flip-flop are in phase with each other, and none of them have a propagation delay relative to the other signals. Finally, we need a way of telling the circuit when the data on the memory bus is a character value a color value, or a bit mask. I'm going to add in a 74HC138 308 decoder, which effectively breaks out all 8 pixel slots in a CPU cycle. I'll tap off the 6th, 7th, and 8th outputs for character load, color load, and bit mask load, respectively. This gives me all the timing signals I need for now. Next, I need some way to store the character data and color data. I can do this with some simple octal D type flip flops hanging off the memory data bus. These are latched by the character load and color load signals, respectively. After that, I need to store the pixel data from the bitmap read. In character mode, each bit in the byte represents one pixel on the screen, so the data in the byte needs to be serialized and sent to the monitor one bit at a time. To achieve this, I'm going to use a 74HC166 shift register. When the load signal is low and we get a positive edge on clock, the data is latched internally. After the load, D7 is outputted immediately. Then, on each subsequent positive edge of clock, the next bit along starting from D7 going down to D0 is outputted, one bit at a time. The next byte comes along, we latch it in with a parallel load, and it gets serialized over the next eight clocks. The shift register load signal on the 74HC166 is the bitmap load signal coming from the clock circuit. Let's wire in these two registers in the shift register. Starting with memory data 7, I'm extending the bus down to these four chips here. The leftmost chip is a 74HC574, which captures the bit mask for multicolor mode. I'll go over this in more detail in the next video.
immediately to the right of this chip is another 74HC574, which is the color register. In this video, I'm only aiming to get a monochrome image to work, so I don't need this yet, but it makes sense to wire it in now. Next along the left, we have the 74HC166 shift register, which we will be using. The rightmost chip is yet another 74HC574, which is the character register. I actually need both of these chips to get the monochrome output to work. The wire starts off in the memory system on the left. Then, as one continuous piece of wire, it connects to all four of these chips. Then it goes across to the other side of the raster generator, where I wire it to the 74HC245 I put in earlier. I think there are mixed opinions about showing the build, but the main reason I'm showing you these videos is so that you get a sense of what's involved in building a project like this. With the full memory expansion, which I'm going to be using because I have such a large static RAM, the character matrix starts at 1000 hex and the color map starts at 9400 hex, but both of these use the same lower 9 bits. These 9 bits come from the Rasen generator, and I wired them up in the last video. For now, I'm going to hardwire these addresses on the inputs in the address multiplexer, just to get the machine going. But eventually, these addresses are programmable. Next is the bitmap address. In the standard configuration, this maps to 8000 hex. The lowest 3 bits of the character address are the scan line number within the character, Remember, when I program the raster generator, I set this to be bits 9 through 11 of the raster address. So, they get wired in here. The next 8 bits of the bitmap come from the character read itself, which is simply the output of the character register. These get wired into the address multiplexer here. For the upper 5 bits, I'm going to hardwire them to 8000 hex for now. All right, we're nearly ready to go. We just need to get the memory map and the V is sorted out. The 6502 doesn't have any I.O. ports like the Z80, so all of the I.O. needs to be memory mapped, which means every device needs to be mapped to a memory location. Because of this, the VIC-20 has a complex address map, with the ROM and the RAM filling up most of the address space, except around the VIC chip and the two VIAs. The first thing I need to do is select between the EEPROM and the static RAM. For the fully expanded VIC-20, we have 32 kilobytes of static RAM in the lower half of the address map, although BASIC can only see 27.5k of this. At 8000 hex, we have the character bitmap which is in ROM. 9000 hex is for the IO map devices, particularly the VIC chip and the two VIAs. 8000 through FFFF is again reserved for ROMs. Specifically, the game's cartridge, BASIC, and the kernel code. Now, I could generate a Kano map and compute the sum of products, but a simpler way is to use a 74HC151, which is an 8 to 1 multiplexer. This is similar to the 74HC153, but instead we have 8 inputs per output rather than 4 inputs per output. It turns out, that I can actually generate any 4 input function with a 74HC151 and an inverter. The upside of using an 8 to 1 multiplexer is that it's much easier to change the logic compared to a traditional OR of ANDS logic implementation. The output signal from the 74HC151 goes to the chip select bar input of the main memory EEPROM. This chip also has an inverted output, and I'm going to send that to the chip select on this static RAM. I've removed the liquid crystal display, but I've left the connector in place. VIA2 has the keyboard connected, and I've just wired it up exactly the same as the VIC-20. Now, I need the select signals for the VIAs. The actual VIC-20 uses a 74LS138. When it's presented with an address in the range of 9000 hex, this output will be asserted, which goes to the chip select bar input of both VIAs. I've blatantly copied this circuit, mainly because it's super simple, but we still need to differentiate between the VIAs. Fortunately, the VIAs have a second chip select input which is active high. 
One of them is connected to the CPU address bus A4, and the other is connected to the CPU address bus A5. Because of this, the VR on the left will be in the range of 9020 hex, and the one on the right will be in the range of 9010 hex. You can see here, I've basically wired up the VRs exactly the same way. The last thing I need to do before I power up is to lay the active signal by one character to hide the memory fetches for the first character in a scan line. Then I end it with the pixel data from the shift register and send it to the VGA port. Alright, let's connect it up. I get the VIC20 startup screen with 28159 bytes available for basic. The cursor's flashing, that's good. This uses an interrupt controlled by the VIA, so at least I can write to the VIA chips. When I first tried the keyboard though, it didn't work. Not a single letter. Sometimes, you can dive straight into a bug and get as much data as you can, like I did when A8 was short to A13 on the breadboard build. Other times, it's best just to stop and think. In this case, I did the latter, and I realised that the VIAs are on the CPU side of the data transfer buffer, but I haven't disabled it when the VIAs are being accessed. I'll get a conflict between the static RAM output and the VIA, particularly when reading data from the VIAs, and I suspect the 74HC245 will win. Anyway, I added some circuitry to disable the buffer for VIA memory access. The keyboard worked. In the next video, I'm going to get colour working. This is actually pretty cool. I spent countless hours as a kid programming the VIC-20. In fact, this is where I was first exposed to 6502 assembly language, which has become a huge part of this channel. As you can see though, I've still got a bit of work to do on at least some graphics modes.